So for a lot of today, we'll be using the audience response. So if you're feeling very confident today, you can answer and then put your name after it because it's all going to be free texting. But if you want to be anonymous, that's quite fine as well. So just to quickly review, I think Dr. Crum did Monday the visual anatomy. So just so we're all on the same page real quick. So vision or light comes in the eye, goes to the retina, back down the optic nerves, decussates at the chiasm, uh, temporal fibers stay on the same side, nasal fibers decussate to the opposite side. So retrochiasmal, you've got input from both eyes. And then light goes down the optic tract, synapses on the lateral geniculate nucleus, which is in the thalamus, and then radiations go through the parietal temporal lobe back to the occipital lobe. And visual fields, as you know, hopefully, are not perfect circles. We've got more temporal field than we do nasal, <clears throat> so it's more of an oval, so that's something important to keep in mind. And then our blind spots are around 15 degrees temporally. So let's just start verbal, well, not audience responses. So you're walking down the hall, and you pick up a piece of paper, and it's a visual field, and you see this. What do you think that that patient had? You just shout it out whenever you have any ideas. So what's the visual field effect? Yeah, secocentral scotoma, so it's central extending over to the blind spot, so that's secocentral scotoma. And which eye is it? Okay. Left eye. So this would be where a normal blind spot would be, and this is the secocentral scotoma. <coughs> so what's your differential diagnosis? So could be so we don't know anything about the right eye, but it could be normal, it could also be like this. So you're thinking correct along the lines of optic neuropathy, uh, potentially glaucoma could look like this. So that's all good. And then so seco central scotoma is affecting this papillomacular bundle in here. And this area in particular is very sensitive to oxidative stress, so things like metabolic deficiencies or um, medications like ethambutol is one to think of, can cause significant stress to this area and cause a secocentral scotoma. So here's the case, and we'll use audience response with this. So 55-year-old man, progressive visual decline in the left eye for two to three months. He felt like his right eye was normal. No significant past medical history, no other ocular history. And these are his visual fields. So let's use audience response, and it's just free text. So let's first name what the visual field effect is. If you want to in the same response, you could localize it too. So we got two junctional scotomas, 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a pretty smart, functional person. Um, so chiasm affecting some right eye temporal fibers as well. So that's correct that this is a junctional scotoma. So what we have is basically diffuse depression of the left eye, but a vertical meridian respecting temporal <laughs> defect in the right eye. So you're correct with chiasmal, uh, is localizing to the chiasm, but why is it causing more vision loss on the left side? So it's, so it's affecting the chiasm, but it's more affecting the left optic nerve. So this is more of a left optic neuropathy in addition to a chiasm compression. So you know it's at the chiasm or behind because you're getting this uh, vertical meridian respecting temporal defect in the right eye, but you're getting this diffuse depression of the left eye. So that's more anterior to the chiasm. So the, as a definition of junctional scotoma, it's at the junction of the optic nerve and the chiasm affecting, in this case, more of the left optic nerve, but catching those fibers in the chiasm that gives you the temporal defect in the right eye. So what kind of lesions might be causing this? What's the differential diagnosis for chiasm? Pituitary. So pituitary macroadenoma, what other tumors would be, could be there? Cranial pharyngiomas, apoplexy. What other tumor? Meningioma, what other aneurysm? Mm-hmm. Um, how about in the autoimmune category? So optic neuritis or chiasmitis, which could be aquaporin-4, MOG, could be MS optic neuritis. So this was this particular patient with a very large pituitary macroadenoma. And so one of the interesting things in this patient was that he really just felt like his left eye was a little bit blurry. He didn't notice anything in his right eye. So this is why our testing brings out often more information than just what they tell you and your exam. If you had done red desaturation, you probably would have picked up this visual field. So he got that removed and had really good recovery with this. So next case, 19-year-old man, painless loss of vision in the left eye that's been progressive over three days. Three weeks later, he had no improvement in that eye and now has developed painless vision loss in his right eye. So what's top on your differential? And let's audience response that. What's your uh, numbers after your name again? I think it was 474. <clears throat> so hereditary optic neuropathy levers, MS. So some MS, lots of levers. Why is MS maybe less likely? Painless. Painless. 
So a young man, vision loss, one eye, painless, shortly after vision loss, the other eye, even without any other information, your levers is high on your list. So this is his exam. He's count fingers in the right eye, 2400 in the left, has no color vision, neither eye. There's no APD, full motility. His fundus exam has some peripapillary telangiectasia and some kind of a pseudoedema appearance. What would you expect his visual field to show? Just shout it out. Yep, so this is mitochondrial, so causes oxidative stress, and that, par that papillomacular bundle is very sensitive to oxidative stress. So you would expect bilateral sacrocentral scotomas. So this is his visual field. So that was that case. So Lieber's most commonly, but not only, uh, uh, clearly, um, younger man, um, could be a family history, doesn't have to have a family history. Again, painless vision loss, one eye, usually within a few months, painless vision loss in the other eye. Secocentral scotomas would be classic. Um, they can get kind of the pseudo edema appearance of their optic nerves, with like the, what this patient had, little peripapillary telangiectasias. So if you see something that looks like a full disc or kind of looks swollen with this history, then Lieber's is high in your differential. But don't rule out Liebers in women or even older women. It can definitely happen in that scenario too, but this would be the classic kind of textbook Liebers case. So next case, so audience response, where's the lesion? And I wanted to point out that the foveal thresholds are 30 in the left eye, 39 in the right eye, and vision's 20-20 in both eyes. to see your answer, Chris, <laughs> you could, or whoever's answer. So for this one, we've got glaucoma, love stroke, uh, macular sparing. Uh, yeah, so let me clear. So those that got in, so you, um, most of them were thinking bilateral occipital sparing the posterior poles of the occipital lobe. Someone said glaucoma, that could also be true because we really have no other history to know how quickly this came on. Um, so, so someone tell me why this is bilateral occipital lobe. Three of you said it, so what made you say that? Yeah. So can someone tell me kind of the arrangement of vision in the occipital lobes? So I think you would know based on how you're describing it, but so why does the sparing of the posterior pole cause this? Yeah, so 
occipital lobe, the more posterior <coughs> you go, that's your, where your central vision is, and the more anterior in, into the occipital lobe is your peripheral vision. And some people will have their posterior pole supplied by the MCA artery. So if they've got a bilateral PCA stroke, then they'll take out the anterior and cause a lot of peripheral vision loss in both eyes, but if it's bilateral. But if they've got in, um, blood supply from the MCA to the very posterior occipital lobes, so they'll have macular sparing, which is exactly what this guy had. So this guy was a very unfortunate guy who was at work on Veterans Day a couple years ago and fell off a ladder while hanging the American flag and had head trauma and then had complications with uh, hemorrhage and then he kind of herniated and blocked off his bilateral PCAs. So he had strokes of the bilateral occipital lobes, but sparing the posterior poles, allowing him to have the central island of vision in both eyes. So again, kind of to, to localize people with central islands of vision in both eyes, it could be a retina problem, uh, like retinitis pigmentosa causes a lot of peripheral vision, but spares central <coughs> advanced glaucoma could look like that, um, or if it's cerebral, then it's bilateral occipital, sparing the posterior poles. Any questions on that one? Can you still have that good of a foveal threshold if it's really advanced RP? Uh, maybe not. Yeah. So this one's a bit tougher, and I might say this for our neurology resident because it's a CAT scan and things aren't as bright as MRIs. I mean, did you have a black PCA stroke? What do you see? Like, describe it and... Oh, yeah. So, so you're looking at an axial CT scan. It's in the, uh, in the brain view. Um, you can see a loss of gray-white differentiation in your left um, posterior So you can just see that area of hypodensity and where you have a decrease in the gray-white differentiation right there. And what does that mean for all the so ophthalmologists here? This person probably had a stroke in this area. Um, sometimes you're surprised at MRI, but they probably had a stroke. <laughs> probably. Probably several hours ago. So, so based on what she said, where would you guys think the visual field effect would be? So we've got left, primarily occipital involvement. So some kind of right homonymous. So hers was more involving the inferior left occipital lobe. And in the occipital lobe, there's a division, so there's a superior, inferior, so you can get quadrantinopias from the occipital. So if you involve the inferior, then you get a contralateral, superior, quadrantinopia, and then vice versa. So here's the case, 27-year-old woman, she was five and a half weeks pregnant, came with vision loss uh, in both eyes, and then a headache times one week. The QD is 2020. She had no APD, normal color vision. So, what are you going to do? Send her home? Okay. Because you're concerned about? What are those things? What else is on the differential? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. How does that cause vision loss? What do you say cavernous sinus? Uh, what are the kind of thrombosis? Venous or just, yeah, venous sinus in general. And how does that cause vision loss? So venous sinus thrombosis causing elevated intracranial pressure, causing causing optic disc edema, causing peripheral vision loss. So she's got 20-20 vision. So unless you're, uh, if you're a really non-thorough doctor, you might not know what's going on. But then you look in her eyes and you see this. So highest on differential now. So elevate intracranial pressure because she's got bilateral optic disc edema with preserved visual acuity. So visions 20-20 both eyes, significant edema both eyes. These are her visual fields. So what are you, what's your thought process? What are your next steps at this point? So we're still in Moran Clinic. It's your second day as an attending. <laughs> Send her to the ER for imaging. What kind of imaging? Um, MRI of the fetus. MRI of the abdomen? Yes. <laughs> MRI brain. Uh, I think we then weighs out contrast and then fetus imaging. So you're looking for thrombus is high in your differential because she's pregnant. Uh, but also really out masses. Yep, so you want to relative mass. Um, in general, contrast from MRI is kind of controversial in pregnancy, so some places won't do it, other places will. So without a real indication for contrast, like this case, uh, you could probably do it without contrast. So she had a brain MRI, which was normal, Pretty sure it was without contrast, I don't remember. Um, did have findings of elevated intracranial pressure, which include, shout out those findings. Finding of the globes, empty cella. Yep. And had a lumbar puncture and opening pressure of 56, but otherwise normal CSF. So what's your next step at this point? So these are her visual fields. So you want to relieve pressure. So yeah, she got admitted <laughs> for a lumbar drain to relieve pressure. And then our general kind of protocol is to admit for lumbar drain and then evaluate them after a few days. And if their visual fields are getting better, then that's reassuring and you can treat them medically. If not, then we start pursuing most commonly, optic nerve sheath fenestration, but some places do shunts more often than we do. So she got drained and started on acetazolamide. Uh, so acetazolamide in pregnancy, just so you know, is category C. So we use it when we have to, uh, because there's really no evidence in humans that it's teratogenic, so we use this when we need to. And so this was her over time. She actually did quite well, and her visual fields got better with the drain, so we, sh we did not have to do any procedures on her. And so it ended up basically here, and this is where she actually is now. So she did well, fortunately. Um, now her optic disc edema is resolved. She's got pal palaris optic nerves, though, but doing well, so, and delivered. So that's audience response, this one. So name the visual field effects and then localize it.
So right hemline is hemianopia with right edge temporal sparing, left occipital temporal crescent. Well, is mostly correct. So right homonymous hemianopia, because this space is missing, but you've got this thing over here in the right eye, in the very far per periphery. So this is called the temporal crescent. And so as we talked about, the occipital lobe is arranged. So central macular vision is posterior. Then the more anterior go you go is your peripheral vision. So we know that this is the left occipital lobe because you have a right homonymous hemianopia, and then because we're picking up this temporal crescent, we know that the anterior portion of the occipital lobe on the left is spared. So this would be an example of a lesion kind of sparing the anterior occipital but affecting the rest, giving you that temporal crescent. So our, if you just get a Humphrey visual field, you're not going to pick that up because this is out here between like 60 and 90 degrees, and uh, uh, Humphrey's not going to pick that up, but a, a Goldman should, or on confrontation, you can often pick that up. And I think that was Chris. You had that guy with me who had a, I think, a right homonymous hemianopia, but he's like, but I can see way out here. And so that's exactly this going on. So he spared his anterior occipital lobe. So here is kind of a schematic again, just to point that out, that the posterior occipital lobe does the macula, whereas the anterior does the peripheral retina, and again, superior occipital does inferior and vice versa. And again, so if you overlap your visual fields, you've got more of a temporal field that's not covered at all by the contralateral eye. So it is possible to have a lesion in the brain, retrochiasmal, causing just unilateral vision loss, but it's very out temporally in the field that is not even possible to be covered with the contralateral eye. So another case, so 33-year-old woman, uh, she came in reporting trouble finding birds in the sky reading the first parts of words, seeing the mouse on a computer screen. It's been slowly progressive, probably over years, but she was unsure. Felt like it was in both eyes, no family history, no personal history of any vision problems. So her visual acuity was scanning was 20-20 in both eyes. Color was reduced in both eyes. Pupils were normal, no APD. Eye movements were full. And these are her fundus photos. Someone just quickly tell me what you see. We'll just say it's normal. So normal fundus photos. These are her visual fields. What do you guys think about these? What? Oh, sorry, some parasexual defects in both Yeah. Eyes. So if you just look up here, you wouldn't pick it up. But looking down here at the pattern deviation, you can see, and just with her history, you could correlate these with what she's describing to you, very central, pericentral, subtle points that she's not seeing. And then you get a Goldman, kind of definitely in the left eye will confirm that. So localize this. <clears throat> So this is left eye here, right eye, and you can see here with this eye softer, she's got this central scotoma. It's not really picked up on the right eye, but if you go to the Humphrey, you can see it a bit there on the left eye. You can see some spots there right <clears throat> in the center on the right eye. So she's got bilateral, really small central scotomas. So bilateral small central scotomas. Her history was progressive over a few years. And again, just based on her history, it's really small, like just trouble tracking really small things. Um, reduced in both eyes. 
What do you guys, what, just localize it first. Yep, so bilateral macula, and just in general, bilateral sensorial scotomas could be bilateral optic nerve, bilateral posterior pole problems in the occipital lobes. So you get more testing on her. This is her RNFL OCT, which is pretty normal. And then someone described this macula OCT. Centrally in both eyes, like atrophy. But yeah. Otherwise, looks good. Which again correlates with her visual field, correlates with what she's telling you. So she got sent to retina, and she had an ERG, which was actually normal. Um, and I don't remember her name, but I know that they sent Dr. Bernstein saw her and was concerned about a cone dystrophy, and sent off genetic testing. But I don't know her name, so I don't know how that turned out. But uh, so example of bilateral central scotoma is from a retinal problem with basically really subtle findings and you have to be really pay attention to their history when you're, especially when you're reviewing their visual field because those were pretty subtle and, and then do testing to look specifically like this macula OCT. So this is a 15 year old girl, was in a car accident one month and then she came in complaining of blurry vision in the distance and diplopia at near. She had headaches and nausea. She had some neck pain. She went to her <coughs> eye doctor and was told she had peripheral vision loss. What are your thoughts at this point? Could be, so concussion can cause convergence insufficiency, double vision at near. What about her uh, blurry vision? Which that could be could coming be from double. double. What? I said it could, it could also be the double vision that she's experiencing. Right, so some people can vision describe vision. double vision as blurry. That's, so that's, so her visual acuity is 20-20, both eyes. Basically, everything's normal, but she is a XT at near with a remote near point of convergence going with convergence insufficiency. And these are her fundus photos, which are normal. And this is her Humphrey visual field. Describe. Yeah, so they're very constricted. And so are these reals? And then you, you don't believe her because she just got a car accident. She has to be faking. So you get a gold mine and it's the same. <laughs> and so what are some techniques you can do just in the office to see <coughs> if tunnel vision is non-physiologic or not? Tangent screen and what you do at the tangent screen. Yep. Um, if you don't have a tangent screen, you can do this a similar thing, just with confrontation. And same thing, you just back up, and their vision, visual field should expand. But if it's staying the same, a lot of times it's getting smaller, then that's concerning for non physiologic. So this one, I sent her for more testing. So What's the, so when we've got this kind of visual field loss, it could be retina, but her retina looked fine on exam. Um, um, could be brain, but less likely. I think she had already had a normal MRI. So, but I was uncomfortable with her. So I sent her for more retina testing and actually had a quite abnormal ERG and also got sent to Bernstein and he was concerned for 
a genetic type of retinitis pigmentosa in her. So um, don't just dismiss people that you ha that really, I mean, conversion is, is tough. It's probably my least favorite thing. So I tend to do a lot of testing in these people. Not too much inappropriate, I don't think, but I give them the benefit of the doubt most of the time and look for things like this. So, so just kind of conversion can fool you a lot. So don't immediately dismiss them. So here's an audience response. Match the image. So just send in a number for the visual field that this lesion would cause. So one other thing about that previous case is that she came in not really complaining of peripheral vision loss. That was one of the things that tipped me off to that. Uh, it was more blurry, double, uh, but it was incidentally found, her visual field defect, and she was like, I've always seen like this. I don't know why it looks like that. So that was a big clue as well. So this one, let's go back. So we've got some ones and threes. So this is... Where is this lesion located? Oh, this is all one. Wait, are they all one lesion? It's all the same. Oh, yeah, they're all the same person, just different sequences. Anterior occipital On the left. left. So we just, it's just asking for a number not to match Correct. them all in one. That's why oh. it makes sense. That's why I was like, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> How is this possible? Yeah. That was confusing. Um, so, though, so this is anterior left occipital lobe. So this would be a, an example of something that can, a retrochiasmal lesion that can cause just monocular vision loss very temporally. So anterior left occipital lobe could cause a right temporal crescent loss. So that would be number one. Sorry, that was confusing. I didn't predict that. So just for a couple minutes, let's do a few of the, these and just shout them out. So what's the defect? Not central scrotoma. Oh, the circle is the one that you can see. Yes, that's right. So, missing this. So, inferior altitudinal in both eyes. Uh, some lesions that could cause that. So, this would be the field to the uh, brightest, biggest isopter out here, and we can see that the furthest out. Then, as you the isopters become dimmer as you go 
in. And so they can see this isopter here appropriately, but it's missing down here. So, and it respects the horizontal meridian here. So inferior altitudinal defect, both eyes. So bilateral optic neuropathy, such as bilateral ischemic optic neuropathy, would be, yeah. Um, could be, or bilateral superior occipital lobe. And let's do this one. So we've got this visual field defect. So all of this is intact, respecting the vertical meridian, and then not seeing that isopter over here, <coughs> either eye. So in addition to that, we have a right APD. Left optic tract. So the visual field is a right homonymous hemianopia. And explain why you get an APD with an optic tract lesion and why is it on the right side. So left optic tract is the lesion. Why is the APD on the right side? The more temporal fibers that go over to the, to the left side from the right temporal field. So there's a bigger loss yeah. of light perception. That's more, you're correct, the more nasal fibers that yes, see the temporal yeah, field. So in the tract, there's, it's very slight, but a, a little bit of over-representation of the contralateral eye due to us having more nasal fibers because our temporal fields are bigger. So in the tract, there's a little bit of over-representation of the contralateral eye, and APDs are caused by asymmetric um, lesion or asymmetric vision loss anterior to the LGN. So in the optic tract, you can get asymmetric involvement involving a bit more of the contralateral eye. So these APDs are not big, they're really small. So um, if you see a subtle APD uh, on the same side as the homonymous hemianopia, then you're thinking tract lesion. Let's do one more. Um, this was part of your, oh, let's go over your quiz, actually. Don't change anything, because I want to see your answers. So first one, right central scotoma, could be, could be macula problem, could be optic neuritis, any kind of optic neuropathy, basically anything anterior to the optic chiasm on the right side. So second one, left homonymous hemianopia, so we know we're retrochiasmal. So it could, whoa. Um, so could be right occipital, could be right parietal and temporal, could be right optic tract if they have a left APD. Third one, uh, left superior partial quadrantinopia, I'm thinking right temporal lobe with that one could potentially be right in preoccipital, but I expect that to be bigger. Fourth one we just talked about is the right temporal crescent, which should be anterior left occipital lobe. Next, left superior quadrantinopia, homonymous. Um, so right temporal, right inferior occipital lobe. Next, what's the next one? Ring scotomas. They look like rings. Yeah. What causes a ring scotoma? You know, retina. retina. This is a retina thing. What? Yeah, so, but localizing this is a retina, but, and then that differential. Next, bilateral central scotomas or kind of secocentral scotomas. So, could be macula as well, could be bilateral optic nerve, like Lieber's or meta other metabolic or toxic or optic neuritis. Next is, what's this one? Hemicentral 
Yeah. We'll go with that. What does that look like? <laughs> Uh, posterior pole right occipital what's the artery that supplies that in several people MCA, MCA. versus rest of occipital which is PCA any questions Wait, what was that actually called that, that. I would just say left is central scotoma yeah uh, it might have a fancy name but what Posterior pole of the right occipital lobe. So the macular area. Any questions? All righty. Thank you.